that in her case, you cannot heal her. You cannot cure her, you cannot change her situation. So this, to her, this life-sustaining treatment is not useful anymore. Do people with disabilities have to be cured or healed to make a contribution to society? That was Anne Lapointe, the lawyer for Nancy B., the woman in Quebec City who has been paralyzed by Guillain-Barre syndrome. Nancy B's request to have her respirator disconnected has churned up a lot of controversy over the past two weeks. You're watching DNET, the Disability Network. I'm Joe Coghlan. And I'm Susan Pettit. Because of the implications that Nancy B's case has for many people with disabilities, we'll be devoting today's program to the story and questions that it has raised in the disabled community. But first, here's a roundup of this week's disability news. There was more evidence heard this week in Quebec Superior Court involving the case of Nancy B. Nancy B is the young woman with Guillain-Barre syndrome who is living with the aid of a respirator. Last week, she told the court why she wants the machine disconnected. Since then, the court has heard from her lawyer and lawyers for the Quebec government giving reasons why they support her right to die. On Monday, the court heard from lawyers for the hospital. They requested the judge to render a clear, unambiguous decision so that doctors and the hospital know whether disconnecting the respirator will constitute a crime. Superior Court Justice Jacques Dufour is not expected to make a decision before the new year. The head of one of Canada's largest disability organizations says accepting Nancy B's case would set a dangerous precedent for people with disabilities. Raleigh Orr, chairperson of COPO, the Coalition of Provincial Organizations of the Handicapped, told DNET that if people in Nancy B's position were aware of various options, they would see their disability in a different light and could live lives with dignity and meaning. Eight out of ten mentally disabled children in Quebec are segregated from their peers. Instead of going to regular school, they are streamed into special education classes. In a recent case involving David Massill, the Quebec Human Rights Commission called the segregation discriminatory. John Curtin reports. Nine-year-old David Marcil is autistic. He has trouble speaking and some trouble moving. But nothing his parents say should keep him out of regular classes. But David's school board thinks otherwise. So when he left kindergarten, it put him into a special education class. He had no friends since he has gone to the special class. He, ha he has been like a, a support. Different from the others and shunned by the others, just like thousands of other mentally disabled children in Quebec. David's parents fought the school board's policy in court and won. The board is appealing the case. In the meantime, the Marcils have found some powerful allies. You have to put your, your faith in the, the strength of the, those children, not in their weakness. And now they are uh, set aside because of their weaknesses. I think it's, that's discrimination. The Human Rights Commission and Quebec's Office for the Disabled have just finished a study showing integration is the best way to teach mentally disabled children. The kids tend to be happier and learn faster, the study says. If I play golf with somebody who doesn't play well, it doesn't teach me how to play better. The simple fact that I play with somebody who's better than me at times forces me to be a little better, to give more of myself, and sometimes I become better because of this. According to the study, putting everyone together wouldn't be more expensive. The study also says disabled students will not slow down regular classes. Give them a chance, give them an opportunity, and they'll learn much more than you think. The Human Rights Commission wants legislation to stop the segregation of mentally disabled students. The government says it favors integrating them, but has not yet decided on how and when it'll take action to promote that. John Curtin, CBC News, Montreal. Investigators looking into U.S. psychiatric hospitals operated for profit have uncovered many cases of fraudulent insurance claims and practices. Hattie Kaufman of CBS News has this story. Elsie Gable is diabetic. She says she began having nightmares around the time her doctor upped her insulin. She says the doctor then arranged for her to enter this hospital. As I stepped off the elevator, there was the door, said psychiatrist department, and they were standing there waiting on me. I said, well, wait a minute. It, I believe that uh, it, we have come to the wrong place. But I understood them to say, she said, no, no, Mr. Gable, you're at the right place. He says, we know what Miss Gable's problem is. I said, well, what is it? And he said, it's her diabetes. 
said it is all out of whack. Said it's the worst I've ever seen anybody. Then why was she in a psychiatric ward if it was just diabetes? Well, don't uh, don't ask me. She spent 28 days there and was billed for psychiatric visits. She says the doctor never made. Doctor came in and said, "Yes, Miss Gable, said uh, your sugar is best it's been since you've been here. You keep this up, you'll be going home in a few days." But she still didn't go home till the sixth of February, which was 11 days after he said that. Mr. Gable says that was the day his wife's insurance ran out. Blame the victim? Blame the system? It appears the mix of medicine and marketing can create more problems than remedies. And that's this week's roundup of disability news. As we just heard on the news, Nancy B is waiting for a decision whether she will live or die. She has been living in an intensive care unit for two and a half years, and she is totally dependent on a respirator or ventilator. The terms are interchangeable. Steve McPherson of Toronto is another person who was in intensive care for one and a half years before spending another seven and a half years in an institution. While in intensive care, he also used a ventilator. I asked him if he ever thought about the option of ending his life. I never really thought of suicide. I always had a really strong you know, family and friend support. And right from the start, you know, the options of a better life you know, were presented in a certain way. Although I can understand you know, Nancy's situation, you, know, you get stuck in a circle of despair. McPherson has just achieved the goal of moving out of an institution and into an apartment. Later in the show, we'll see how that has changed his life. McPherson put a strong emphasis on the fact that he knew what his options were. Next on DNet, we'll hear how, for many people, that's not the case. Welcome back to DNet. Shafali Sajani has been looking into the implications that Nancy B's case has for people with disabilities. Shafali? Thank you, Sue. For many people in the media, the questions surrounding the coverage of Nancy B's situation have focused on the legal and moral issues. Does she really have the right to put an end to her own life? But for people in the disabled community, the issue is more complex. They question whether she's really making an informed decision. The main obstacles to an informed decision could be lack of information or misinformation. And many think that professionals, including doctors and social workers, are often guilty of failing to provide people with their full range of options. One of the people who's critical of the medical profession is Judith Snow. She has muscular atrophy, and like Nancy B, she's paralyzed from the neck down. Her doubts about the situation stem from her own experience. How do you feel about all the media hype surrounding the Nancy B case? Oh, well, frustrated, angry, I guess. And kind of like hopping in my van and going down and visiting her and telling her what's possible. You know? Why do you think you need to do that? Don't you think the people around her right now have told her those, uh, those possibilities? No, I, I really think that uh, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the therapists, all the people who are surrounding her right now are making her feel that it's hopeless, that there's nothing to live for, and they're just not presenting her with the real choices, the real possibilities of her life. And how, how do you know that that's how they would be behaving? Well, medical people see a person with quadriplegia or a person on a ventilator as just a disease, just as a hopeless situation. And they treat that person as if all that's left is for them to die. Have you ever been treated? Oh yes, I've been treated. Oh, I've well. lived in chronic care. I've lived in a nursing home. I've, uh, one particular time, even after I was living out in the community with attendant care, I developed a serious difficulty with my legs and required life-saving surgery. Otherwise, I would have been flat on my back and died of respiratory problems from just lying around. And the doctor said to my friend, you know, what's the point of going through the risk of the surgery? Why don't we just let her lie there and die? 
Now, subsequently, he did the surgery because my friends insisted. But he never came to tell me that. He never came to talk to me about what my real possible choices were. Do you know if that happens to a lot of people? It happens all the time. When I lived in the nursing home, I saw people just giving up and dying because nobody was supporting them to get out back in the community and contribute. What are Nancy B's real choices and what are the choices that people like her actually do have? I think she does have a real choice to die. I support the government's intervention to make sure that she has the right to say that. But she also has the real choice to develop an attendant service around herself or to move into a place that provides for attendant supports and through those supports to go on contributing and participating in society like to get a job perhaps or to find some kind of activity that she really that fulfills her vision of who she is still i mean it has nothing to do with the way her body works it has to do with what she chooses to do with her life so if you could talk to nancy b right now what would you tell her I tell her my own story in depth, which takes a couple hours, right? I tell her about people who were living out in the community with ventilators. I talk to her family. I'd see who was there with her, who would support her to start getting better information. I know a few people in the government in Quebec who provide already individualized funding to some people to live in the community. I get them on the case, right? But that's the, the, her social workers should be doing that. But they don't, they just let people die, it's terrible. When Judith Snow was 20, she was told she wouldn't live past 30. She's now 42. When we come back, we'll meet Tom Wagner, who uses a ventilator and is living with his family. ventilators don't necessarily have to stay in intensive care. Modern technology has evolved to the point where ventilators can be made portable. Tom Wagner has muscular dystrophy and has used a ventilator for the past nine years. He's now 30 years old. He wasn't expected to live past 20. His portable ventilator has allowed him to move back home. Tom Wagner and his mother, Margaret, are both members of the Committee for Independence in Living and Breathing. That's a committee that explores ways to get people who use respirators back into the community. What's it like for you to be in intensive care? Do you remember what it was like? Yes, you, you lose um, control. Um, you have no control, say, um, when you eat and what you eat in general. Uh, routines are totally upended. Um, you have no freedom um, to leave the ICU. Um, there's nothing to do. Pretty depressing. Yes. Mrs. Wagner, how do you feel watching the, all the attention that's being paid to uh, Nancy B? Well, I guess my biggest concern is uh, whether or not she has been told of other living options and possibilities for her because there is a better life outside of ICU for people with high level disability. Did you ever think that uh, your own son might end up feeling as she did? Yes, our, Tom was depressed when he was in intensive care. There was no doubt about that. He found it a very scary place to be. And I, and I don't think that uh, that would have resolved itself had he had to stay there for any length of time. The longest stint in ICU for Tom was two months. Did you ever feel quite as depressed, Tom, do you think? Did you ever think about ending your life? No. Occasionally I'll have periods of depression, just as anyone does, when I will um, wonder if it was worthwhile going on to the ventilator or not but those periods pass, and I've never seriously considered disconnecting the ventilator. Tom, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about your life and, and what are some of the things that you can do that uh, 
that make your life rich and fulfilling? Well, I live at home with my parents, uh, so I have all those emotional supports, which is important. Um, I'm currently finishing up a degree in history at York University. Um, I use my computer extensively for both school and for entertainment. Uh, I also enjoy getting out into the community often, go to movies and concerts and so forth. Um, it's pretty much the type of life that an able-bodied person would live and consider fulfilling. From the people that you two have talked to in your contact with the medical community, how do they rate the quality of your life, Tom? In general, pretty low. It's often a factor in the decision to ventilate patients. That the assumption that the quality of life is going to be low, and therefore there's no point in ventilating. And how do you respond to that? Well, obviously my quality of life, I consider it to be very high, and the ventilator, um, by prolonging my life, uh, has certainly been worthwhile. A recent study looked at the life satisfaction of people with muscular dystrophy who use ventilators. It was published by the American Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. It came to the following conclusions. This study establishes the considerable extent to which healthcare professionals underestimate these individuals' satisfaction with life. This point is potentially tragic because the physician's judgment of the patient's quality of life appear to affect the likelihood of a patient receiving life-sustaining therapeutic intervention. Coming up next on DNET, another option, living on your own. We're back with another story about the options that are available to people who use ventilators. Steve McPherson, who we met earlier in the show, was paralyzed in a diving accident. He spent one and a half years in intensive care, and he used a ventilator. Later, he exchanged it for a pacer. That's an electrical transmitter that causes his diaphragm to contract at regular intervals. It does the same job as a ventilator. It allows him to breathe. McPherson spent seven years at West Park Hospital in Toronto, an institution which is set up to take care of people who require chronic care. There, through a transition program, he learned ways to take control over his life. By blowing through a straw, he now operates his power chair and a computer. After a long struggle to move out into his own apartment, he was finally successful a few weeks ago. He now lives at an apartment project called Nucleus Housing. I think because I was so ready for it, it was an easy transition. Uh, getting used to the peace and quiet at night, you know, being quite a bit darker than in a hospital room, it's something I always liked. Um, and just that, you know, being on my own and alone, it was a lot nicer than living in a hospital. Attendants come in regularly to help McPherson with many of his daily needs, getting out of bed, washing, eating. Week to week, you book your time for your routine things. Then I st stick to the similar routine that I did at West Park, just because of uh, certain needs. Uh, and if I need help either with pacers or the odd suctioning or, you know, even with the elevator, if I uh, phone up to the office, you know, they're glad to come down and, uh, and help me out whenever they can. Has it ever been lonely for you? I think as lonely as I want to be because the attendants are in and out and I have a good family background and friend structure that, uh, good support there that, you know, I don't really allow myself to get lonely. I'm still enjoying the, the privacy. So that's your apartment. That's the yeah. big entrance. Kitchen. Kitchen. Yeah. yeah. And it's all really wide. Yeah, it's yeah. all open. That's where we are yeah. right there. Okay, 
this environment is a little more open than others that I've seen. And with the environmental control that I have, it uh, allows me to operate you know, lights and things from the living room here. As well, I've got two different switches, one at the side of the bed and one at my workstation in the bedroom that allow me to uh, operate, you know, turn things on off, use the phone, computer, and the TV and VCR. Now, you've been waiting to live on your own for quite some time now. What's it like now that you're actually living independently? I was more than ready to move out. The dream come true, for sure. McPherson's apartment is located in a project of nucleus housing. Ken Chapman is one of the driving forces behind the organization. He was once a resident of Lyndhurst Hospital in Toronto. Mr. Chapman, can you tell me what nucleus housing is designed to do? Uh, to be able to get them out of a chronic care institution, to be able to live independently out in the community, and be able to live a more constructive life. Is it working for the people who live here and for the people who fund it? Is it actually proving to be cost effective? Yes, it is. Uh, the, the costs are definitely much cheaper. Having someone out living in the community with the attending care service versus the high cost of hospitals. What is it meant for you to be able to live independently? Well, living at Lyndhurst Hospital, I spent two years there, and you're in a, a room with three other individuals and having your own apartment and having the freedom to basically do what you want, when you want. Uh, there's no similarities whatsoever. While Steve McPherson no longer uses a ventilator, he says there are many people in Ontario and British Columbia who do, 24 hours a day, and they are living out in the community. We'd like to know what you think. Give us a call on the DNet opinion line. For example, do you think it should be easier for people with disabilities to find out about all their options? We'll give you the phone number in a moment. Last week, we asked you to let us know if you thought the medical profession over-medicates people with disabilities. Here are some of your calls. Rick Beckett from East York, Ontario, has cerebral palsy and is legally blind. Yes, I feel that the medical profession over-medicates people with disabilities. They are very ignorant about what they do to us. They don't, they think because our bodies don't work, our brains don't work either. And this call is from one of our viewers in Calgary, Alberta, who chose to remain anonymous. I don't know whether the medical profession routinely over medicates all disabled people. But in the last seven years, they certainly have over-medicated many elderly people that I've had experience with as I have visited a long-term care member and a long-term care institution. And I think that they are just dreadful for over-medicating and they don't like explanations, they don't like questions about the medication and they do not learn from their mistakes. This week, we'd like to know your thoughts. Do you think it should be easier for people with disabilities to find out about all their options? And that's our show. I'm Joe Coughlin. I'm Shafali Sojani. And I'm Susan Pettit. See you again next week. Here's the number to call to reach the DNet Opinion Line. Call 416-921-7933. That's 416-921-7933. Or write to us at the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. Our fax number is 416-975-5636. There's a lot of moral and legal questions around this issue. Let's get a personal opinion on it, though. Do mm -hmm. you think that people who feel that they don't have, can't make any more contribution to, to the world in their present state should be allowed to commit suicide? Mm. Personally, yes, um, but that's you know, only if they've exhausted you know, all their options.